If Ray Dalio's predicted stock market crash is credible, how should I invest now to protect myself and my family? What Ray Dalio has warned of is a stock market crash potentially followed by either an inflationary or deflationary depression. Why does he think this might happen? In brief, every civilization has a rise and fall. This rise and fall is often driven by what he calls a big debt cycle. Civilizations and nations are often brought down when there is too much debt combined with illogical political dysfunction. He thinks debt and political dysfunction are currently both at levels which statistically have been associated with triggering most of the major national debt crises in the world over the last 100 years. If you want to learn more about Ray Dalio's theory, we made a separate in-depth video solely about Ray Dalio's big debt cycle. In this video, we attempt to answer a different question, which is this. If I think Ray Dalio may be correct, how should I allocate my portfolio between stocks, bonds, real estate, etc., to best protect myself against the possibility of a stock market crash, potentially followed by a prolonged period of inflation or deflation? In other words, what asset allocation will protect me best? If this was 1928, a year before the great stock market crash of 1929, and I was a British citizen looking at the fall of the British Empire, where could I have invested to protect my family's future? The solution needs to satisfy a number of conditions. First, if there is a stock market crash, I need to preserve enough of my capital to prevent me from going bankrupt. I need to be able to continue paying all my bills, that is, housing, grocery bills, etc. Second, I also need my money to continue to grow at a rate above inflation so that I will have enough for my retirement. What is the answer if I am 21 years old and I have $10,000 saved? And what is the answer if I'm 65 years old and I have $1 million saved? Age and current savings level are two important factors to consider among many. Traditionally, financial advisors have said every situation has a different solution, and it is complicated. For example, a popular system pushed by financial advisors is the life cycle investing theory. When you are young, you should invest in stocks. As you get older, you should have more bonds, etc. In a similar vein, financial advisors say the answer also depends on how much you currently have saved. If you are wealthy, there is one answer, and if you have very little saved, there is another answer. But mathematically, when you look at each possible asset class option, that is, stocks, bonds, real estate, etc., and you look at each asset class's statistical behavior in terms of average annual return and variance around said return, a surprising answer arises. It turns out there is only one optimal asset allocation for everyone regardless of age and current savings level. And this solution is suggested by Warren Buffett no less. Warren Buffett says there is one optimal asset allocation for practically everyone. He says the reason why financial advisors say it is complicated and every individual needs a different solution is because if things weren't complex, you wouldn't need to pay a financial advisor 1% every year to help you. Warren Buffett's optimal solution is called the 90-10 rule. 90% 90 in a low-cost S&P 500 index fund and 10% in short-term treasuries with a maturity of two years or less. In fact, Warren Buffett has written this rule into his own will. Upon his death, he has instructed the trustee of his wife's estate to do the following. My advice to the trustee could not be more simple. Put 10% of the cash in short-term government bonds and 90% in a very low-cost S&P 500 index fund. I suggest vanguards. I know when people see this 90-10 rule, there will be a lot of immediate skepticism and doubt. Even though, respectfully, Warren Buffett is kind of known for being good at investing. This doubt mainly arises because of commonly cited data like this. This chart shows compounded average nominal and real returns between 1960 and 2017 for the most common asset class options. It seems to show healthy risk-adjusted real returns over a 57-year long period for everything. And hey, look, real estate outperforms equities. Warren Buffett is wrong. But think about the time period used to generate this data. 1960 to 2017. This period represents an unprecedented period of prolonged peace and stability 
post-World War II. Do you think this Goldilocks period will last forever? Also, doesn't it conveniently leave out the Great Depression? Whether or not you like Ray Dalio, he raises an interesting point. And that point is this. According to his big debt cycle theory, crises caused by debt tend to occur once every 50 years or so. The danger of this is that the educational effects of a crisis often do not occur within the living memory of the current generation of investors because the last crisis that occurred often happened during their grandparents' lifetimes. So you often end up with people operating without the benefit of truly long-term 2020 hindsight. When you factor in better, longer-term data, commonly held beliefs about investing often collapse. For example, bonds. It is a common adage that bonds are guaranteed to be safe always. If you were a retiree and you consistently held a well-diversified, highly rated basket of bonds with an average maturity of 20 years from 1945 to 1981, how much money do you think you would have made? 10%? 100%? 200%? Answer. You would have lost 66% of your principal. From 1945 to 1981, the U.S. experienced a 36-year-long bear market in bonds, primarily because of inflation. As another example, let's look at real estate. According to this chart, real estate is a no-brainer. It produces excellent returns. But let me ask you a few questions. Professor Robert Schiller is a Nobel Prize-winning economist. He is the Schiller in the Case Schiller U.S. National Home Price Index. Would you feel comfortable saying he is a credible expert on housing prices? Yes or no? According to Professor Schiller, between 1890 and 1990, a period spanning 100 years, how much did U.S. home prices appreciate in real terms? If you held a house for this 100-year period, do you think you would have made a profit of 50% or 600% or 2,000%? The answer is about 0%. Yes, I said zero. It is beyond the scope of this video to analyze each asset class individually, but if there is interest, I can create more in-depth videos specifically delving into individual asset classes. For those who own a lot of bonds, I have already made a video about bonds. The only asset class I'm aware of that stands up to this type of long-term data test, which provides protection against both inflation and deflation, is U.S. equities. Many studies have back-tested a strategy of holding an equity portfolio for 25 years over every possible scenario, including scenarios which include the worst timing possible, like buying stocks just before the stock market crash of 1929, etc. The overwhelming result of these studies is that even if you have the worst luck in the world and buy at the worst time, if you're able to hold on to your stock portfolio for 25 years, you're almost guaranteed to still produce a nice real return above inflation. For example, this chart shows an analysis by Princeton professor Burton Malkiel. In this chart, if you can only hold on to your portfolio for one year, your range of possible outcomes varies between negative 37% and 53%. But if you can hold on to your portfolio for 25 years, your possible range of outcomes shrinks to between 6% to 17%, with an average rate of return of a little over 10%. No other asset class can say it provides this level of hardy resilience against all manner of inflationary and deflationary events. So therefore, the only logical choice is a portfolio overwhelmingly made up of U.S. equities. The problem with a portfolio made up of U.S. equities is there is a tremendous amount of variance in the short term accompanied by an overwhelming likelihood of a narrow band of good returns in the long run. As a result, a common complaint with this strategy is, it does not offer income stability in the short term, which is true. The nature of the beast with finance and everything else in life is there is no perfect solution. Life is hardwired for trade-offs. There is always just the best available solution given a limited imperfect option set. No solution provides guaranteed short-term income plus guaranteed long-term gains. There will be volatility in the short run. The key is if you can hang on and not go bankrupt in the short run statistically, you are almost guaranteed to recover and make a good return with U.S. equities in the long run. So how do you guarantee you can hang in there for the long run and not go bankrupt? The answer is another billionaire rule.
This one is called the Keep Your Fixed Costs Low Rule. This won't guarantee you will survive, but it offers the best possible chances for you. How does this rule work? Have you noticed many famous billionaires like Warren Buffett drive old cars and live in modest homes? What they are doing is making sure their balance sheet is clear of any long-term liabilities. In other words, any long-term fixed costs that they are legally required to pay, even if their incomes drop. Examples of fixed costs include things like 30-year mortgages or 10-year student loans, etc. By this logic, it's okay for them to buy expensive first-class plane tickets while on vacation because if the market tanks, no one can legally force them to keep buying expensive plane tickets for the next 10 years. On the other hand, instead of buying a fancy mansion with a 30-year mortgage, they often opt to rent a small place or buy a small modest house with cash, avoiding the need for a mortgage because 30-year mortgages can be legally enforced. The logic is, if bad times hit, I want to be able to quickly downsize all of my expenses so I can survive until the stock market recovers and I can start living well again. If I have a hefty 30-year fixed mortgage, I can't do that and I run the risk of going bankrupt and losing my home if a calamity hits. For experienced investors, the most important thing is staying in the game. Another main objection people have to the 90-10 rule is they think they can time the market. They think, I am smart and I can spot when the stock market has peaked and when it is at its low. Financial advisors often encourage clients to do this because it generates more trading fees and makes the client feel like they need an advisor. If you believe you know how to time the market, perhaps you might want to stop watching this video. From personal experience, I have found it is impossible to convince people they are not smarter than Warren Buffett. Ego and human psychology are insurmountable hurdles. There is a very large body of academic statistical evidence backed up by real-world practitioner advice from people like Warren Buffett that says market timing is a horrible idea. It just doesn't work. If you do not believe me, please Google this. If it was possible for talented individuals to reliably time the market, would it be logical to assume that people like Warren Buffett and hundreds of other large institutions like Goldman Sachs would be actively doing so? If this is a logical assumption, may I ask another question? If you still believe in market timing, what makes you think you can outsmart Warren Buffett and friends if they also are trying to time the market? What is stopping them from buying early and taking all the market timing returns off the table before you get there? As a final point on market timing, if market timing was a proven reliable tool, the concept that index funds are better than actively managed mutual funds would collapse because talented fund managers would just consistently time the market year after year and outperform the index. But as you may be aware, indexing has slowly but surely over the last several decades come to dominate investing. To summarize, I submit we may have established that the 90-10 rule is the best solution available among the complete set of suboptimal choices. Why do I believe this? There are comprehensively only two possible choices when investing. First, there are options that involve trying to time the market. And second, there are options that involve not trying to time the market. Do we agree there are no other options? I submit we may have shown market timing does not work. So if you rule out trying to time the market, the only other option is buy and hold for the long term. Within the options available under the buy and hold category, the only asset class that protects you against both inflation and deflation while providing a return above inflation is U.S. equities. If Ray Dalio is right and calamity might be on the way, there is no plan which can guarantee 100% of investors a 100% survival rate. But the best available option among a suboptimal option set is Warren Buffett's 90-10 rule. Thank you for watching. This video was sponsored by Stream.com. Stream is the world's best shopping list app. Stream believes life should be simple. Stream's shopping list app features a simple design, and it's super easy to share a shopping list with friends, family, and coworkers. Try Stream.com today. That's S T R I I I M dot com. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe.